Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Namita Kalyan Prakar, and I'm a Demand Generation Manager at Arista Networks. Welcome to our discussion around frame accurate video routing with IP based broadcast infrastructure. I'm very pleased here to have with us Felix Krukels and Erling Hedfist from LAVO. They're a leading manufacturer of digital audio consoles and IP-based routing equipment. We're also joined by Warren Belkin from Arista, who has a strong focus on professional networked media. Um, now, if anyone in the audience has questions during the duration of this broadcast, please feel free to ask them through the chat function in your user portal. We'd be happy to answer your questions. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Felix from LAVO to begin our conversation. Thank you very much, Namita. I would like to take the chance to talk about the reason why we are going all uh, all this path. TV production uh, has been changed a lot, and content distribution has moved from a linear model to a non-linear model. Nowadays, we consume TV content on any platform, whether it's the internet, whether it's the mobile phone, my iPad, whatsoever. That drives a lot the factor behind this. That drives uh, that content has to be used a lot more than in the past. And we have to find new solutions to produce all this content. We definitely cannot increase the budgets to, um, to uh, produce all this content. At the same time, video content production has changed dramatically in many areas. Nowadays, a simple reflex camera and my home edit suite is good enough to produce uh, high quality video clips. And how are they distributed via the internet on YouTube? No tape, no digital hard drives are any more necessary for archiving everything is in the cloud. So when once everything is in the cloud, we are able to consume the content wherever we want to. Everything is following this mega trend, even the kitchen, the washing machine, the car, the radio, the kitchen radio is part of this cloud and is becoming smart. Thus, that means the backbone behind this huge industry is a strong driver for that technology. Isn't this earning? That's right. Uh, thanks, Felix, and hello, everyone. Um, yes, IP and, and Ethernet technology uh, is a cost driver due to the economies of scale, and it has already taken over multiple industries that used to use bespoke equipment, just as the uh, broadcast industry is doing. An example is uh, the banking industry in the 80s and the uh, uh, phone and carriers uh, of the 90s and the early 2000s that used to have proprietary technology, which are now using uh, uh, commercially available IT technology. And every time this, this happened, it allowed that particular industry to save massive amounts of capex by, by utilizing the economies of scale of an, of an IT uh, and Ethernet industry. The broadcast space is unfortunately the last holdout. Um, and, but what's interesting also already in the broadcast industry is if you look at the production side um, in the non-live space as well as the pretty much the entire distribution side, they've already moved to an IP uh, technology. The last holdout has been the live production um, facility infrastructure and that's what we're addressing here today. So. Part of the problem why, why this is the last holdout is that broadcast video uh, is built on standards that date way back to the days of analog TV, uh, all the way back to the 30s in, in some case. And every time a new standard was developed, it meant that they uh, developed a new infrastructure for that standard. It's kind of like uh, every time you, you buy a new car, it would require you to repave the road and make a new infrastructure for it. it it's quite maddening, actually. Um, and this infrastructure was always created as a point-to-point -point infrastructure. That's why it's called transmission chains uh, in the industry, that you tie one component uh, in line to the other component, which creates very static and very inflexible um, infrastructure. Now, IP and Ethernet technology uh, offers a tremendous amount of flexibility, um, both due to the fact that we can now loop services um, uh, on demand into an IP infrastructure by simply telling a control system that this function is now required. The system would go out and, and find the appropriate function uh, in the cloud, perhaps, if it's a, if it's a virtual function. Uh, and then tie that back into the transmission chain. So you can now create 
new programming, new transmissions, and new feature set by the click of a button. Well, in the past, it required a screwdriver, some coax cables, and a few other things. Coupled with the fact that IP NETA technology is, is multiplexing by, by design, means that we are now able to take uh, any size uh, capacity of our, of our uh, video ports and, and multiplex them into, uh, into IP, thus not using the full capacity which we used to do in a video router. And I'll exemplify this a bit in the next slide. So um, legacy video routers, what, what the market is using today, uh, are frequently um, in the size of about 100 to 500, sometimes up to about 1,000 by 1,000 for the very, very large systems. And um, once you go past that point, it requires cascading uh, multiple routers together, um, which creates an exponential problem. So the reason that the routers only go up to a certain size is due to the um, electrical characteristics of that particular router. And each router's port is designed to handle the maximum amount of capacity allowed in the standard. So, for example, a 3 gig router, uh, a 3 gig video router, sorry, um, if you connect a, a lower bandwidth video stream, because all the video standards are backwards compatible, will still use up 3 gigabit on the back plane. Now, IP and Ethernet technology is inherently different, which allows us to create a much more efficient infrastructure. But not only that, but also with uh, IP and Ethernet technology and with the switches that are available today, we are now reached the point where the technology has finally outpaced the capacity of the video router. So while in the past, one of the reasons people weren't using IP and Ethernet for, for uh, video contribution and, and live production was that it simply didn't offer the speeds that were required. Nowadays, with the capacity, for example, one of the uh, uh, Arista switches, we can get up over a thousand 10 gigabit Ethernet duplex ports in 11 rack units. Now, this means a, a paradigm shift and a, and a 10x at least capacity shift uh, as opposed to uh, a legacy video um, broadcast router. For example, in uncompressed, we're looking at 7,000 by 7,000 signals. And with visually lossless, extremely fast light compression, we're looking at 50,000 by 50,000. So this clearly takes, uh, um, this clearly solves the problem of uh, worrying about capacity because you need to produce more content for the same amount of money. But it's more than just that. It's, it's also being future-proof when it comes to the video formats. So the shift from analog to, to serial digital in the industry took 25 years. The shift between SD and HD took 10, 12, 15 years. And then from HD to 3 gig took five years or maybe less. And now people are talking about 4K or maybe 8K. And there's the, the, the changes in, in the standards are coming quicker and quicker and quicker. But you still need to amortize your equipment over the same amount of time and maybe even more. You need to milk more out of your existing infrastructure. And therefore, you need something that is a lot more future-proof, i.e. SDI doesn't scale. So what is the reason that um, broadcast industry is the last to change? Um, it's, some of the reasons are that uh, IP was never designed to handle the type of um, requirements that we have in the, in the broadcast space, which are high bandwidth, uh, real time, um, and very high quality of service. You know, no um, um, retransmissions are allowed in TV. You expect your, your internet to drop well, when you're sending an email. You expect your, your phone, uh, your mobile phone to disconnect every now and then. But you don't expect a, a disconnect in the, in the 8 o'clock news when you're watching it at home, right? However, many of these problems uh, have now been solved, um, some of which have been solved through the, the you know, enormous capacity that we're now able to get out of the Ethernet switches. Others have been, been solved in the control space by using SDN and DirectFlow 
to um, uh, address the requirements um, from the broadcast space. And um, Felix, you're going to talk a little bit more about how these problems have been uh, solved? Yes, for this let's have further look uh, on a typical infrastructure we, we are addressing with this uh, new approach. Typically in a broadcast uh, infrastructure you have a bunch of devices for video, for audio, for control, like servers, like mixing consoles, vision mixers, and all the edge devices to get the signals in and out. All of this needs broadcast orchestration. You need to control all of this stuff and you want to do this with the same robustness which you know from, from SDI and MADI routers. The paradigm shift we are having right now it doesn't mean that we have IP with just in a few years. It won't happen with all the devices from this year to the next year. We will have the legacy SDI, MADI, even analog in audio for the next five years, ten years, it's perhaps fifteen years even. So we have to have something which is controlling both, which is controlling the uh, typical studio uh, parameters like tele management, timeline management, scheduling, and all sorts of stuff, multi viewer layout, plus the control over the complete IP network. Therefore, uh, we are uh, investigating heavily in combining the IP management with the studio orchestration, calling it a broadcast orchestration uh, server, a broadcast orchestration control with SDN control plus our VSM studio control system. IP routing has to integrate as smooth as today MADI and SDI is doing into the production workflow. Our director, our cameraman, our engineers, video audio engineers, our uh, server operators, they don't want to learn anything about IT. They don't want to learn anything about how the IP flow goes from the source to, to the origin. They simply want to push a button to get content from a source to a destination. Therefore, we have to make it as smooth as possible and uh, have to develop a lot of software to orchestrate uh, all, this, all this workflow. What are the tools to do this? Um, first of all, we need SDN control to get 100% control over the IP network to guarantee the reliability we have today already in broadcast environments, the same with IP infrastructure. Secondly, we need a studio control system which is doing all this stuff on top of routing, on top of IP streaming control. And we definitely need a lot of edge devices which are doing the SMT 2022-6 video streaming which are doing AES 67 slash Ravenna audio streaming and of course a lot of video audio processing and the main thing we need broadcast orchestration to uh, handle all this stuff. And as you can see all this is based on protocols which are already available. It's not anything which has to be invented. It's already available and it's all based on layer 3 IP. Let's have a quick look to why are we going to a layer 3 solution in broadcast and not stay with a layer 1 or layer 2 solution. Therefore, I'll have a quick look to the OSI model. And we won't run through everything in detail. It's just to visualize what are the pros and the cons. Layer 1 is simply using the copper, the fiber, whatsoever media uh, to build in proprietary solutions at the source and destination point for a point-to-point -point solution. Same what we have used in SDI and MADI for a long time. Layer 2 is simply using the data link of Ethernet being able to switch something, to route something through an Ethernet switch, but still uh, having proprietary solutions as edge devices, which means we don't have an open approach to have uh, various components hooked up together. Only layer 3 is giving us the complete abstraction layer that we are packet switching our broadcast media, our audio, our video through the same network which is used for control and for a lot of other stuff at the same time. To get the required quality we need 100% control over the network and we need a lot of methods which do this. There's a lot of pros and cons for various methods. One fundamental problem we have whatever device is trying to do the broadcast switch, it needs to know something about what broadcast is, what video is. And as an example, we will explain how clean switching works in the video world. The switch itself doesn't know anything about a video frame. The edge devices need to know what the video frame is and the edge devices 
uh, switching clean in various methodologies. One is source time switching. Source time switching will work the following that you have a, a stream going on from source A to the destination device. Now the user has the requirement that he want to have another source. He simply pushes the button on his standard studio panel to, uh, to, 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 to get this uh, switch done. Once this is uh, recognized by the control system, the control system prepares a new flow table, a new flow route table for the switch. And the source A, source B, and destination device get the information that they have to switch at a certain time, that they have to change the uh, path through the network. The edge devices are precisely timed with PTP and do the switch by themselves. Whenever the PTP clock arrives exactly the time they have to change, uh, source A stops streaming and source B starts streaming and the destination device knows exactly it has to flip from source A to source B. And this switch is done exactly within the V gap, within the video uh, gap, so this switch is a complete clean switch. It's, it's even going beyond this. This switch is starting uh, at a specific position, could be the beginning of the video frame. We even could do this within a video frame, guaranteeing a constant uh, video stream coming out of the destination device. An alternative solution would be destination time switching. The second solution would work the following. Source A, again, is uh, the video source which is uh, coming out of destination A. And you see the blue line right now. This is the output, the SDI output uh, of this destination device. Again, the operator requests that source B is going out of this destination device. The following happens. The flow tables are prepared within the switch. The streaming is actively going on already. We have already a flow from source B arriving at destination B. No switch has yet been done. You see the PTP clock is still at somewhere at 10 o'clock. And once this arrives, the destination device itself switches from flow A to flow B. But still we have both uh, streams going on. And then we can uh, leave uh, this, uh, the, the first stream uh, and clean up uh, the flow table. Of course, the advantage is only the destination device needs to know exactly how clean switching works. The disadvantage is you have two streams going on at the same time from the switch to the destination device. And think of this destination device would have three, three gigabit streams already receiving a clean switch wouldn't be possible because the 10 gig pipe is already uh, next out completely. To express the solution in a more technical way, the following uh, happens with the flow tables. Uh, the IP addresses and the ports are prepared with a new flow table. You see that there's already two flow tables within the switch. The orange is right now flowing through the switch, and when the PTP time changes, the port numbers are changed, and the second flow gets active, and you never have two flows at the same time running through this uh, switch. We have to guarantee 100% reliability um, for our broadcast environment. Therefore, we want to have 100% control on the switch. We want to have 100% control over the switch ports. And therefore, we are using SDN to, uh, to realize this. Broadcast SDN control would be the one part. Of course, we are thinking now, if we go into this 100% control, are we creating the same solution which we did for many, many years with SDI routers, a proprietary solution? Are we losing all the benefits we were claiming before with a layer three solution? It's not the case. We are controlling as a possible solution parts of the switch with an SDN control system. The other part could be controlled by the office SDN control system for the whole office work in a facility. By software configuration, we could change the amount of ports we want to use within the specific switch. We don't have any more to recable, to reinvest, to rebuild the infrastructure within an equipment room. Just software changes would give us the possibility. And of course, we still have all the different medias which can go through this network. And we would have a gateway from a broadcast uh, network to the office network, for example, to consume broadcast pictures within my office uh, following uh, the feed, which is right now going on in Studio 1, Studio 2, or Studio 3. First learn walking, then learn running. In the beginning, we would see a lot like this, that we take a switch, and this switch is purely for 
uh, for, for broadcast, a dedicated broadcast switch, SDN controlled, but prepared to be combined with the office network. Broadcast orchestration needs to guarantee the same robustness. This is the big claim we have. It needs to, uh, to, to guarantee this and then the same stability of video and audio flows, which we know for many, many years from SDI and MADI routers. But it's going beyond this with, uh, with the uh, new technology and giving us the flexibility we need to create more content every year. Now I will show you a little technical demo out of our lab. You see the setup we have done. There's the Arista switch and a couple of Link 4s hooked up via 10 gigabit pipes and of course a couple of uh, video sources. You see this very nice overview of a typical XY matrix, which is known from SDI routers. This is now stream sources and destinations. And of course you see a typical panel which the operator loves to operate with the sources A and B. And as soon as we push now this button, you see the result. There's a clean switch from source A to source B. Uh, and the output of this uh, destination device shows you this even more clear. You see stream A is active, stream 2 is active, stream 1 is active again, and it's as clear as we know this from the SDI world. So market dynamics demand this new approach, which is very obvious because we can't go on with the same solution which we have done the last, uh, uh, last century. Four main drivers that we are going this, that we want to take this challenge to go IP with all the efforts we have to put into this. The broadcast industry simply want to benefit from the huge driver behind IP technology. They want to gain off the speed of the size of, um, of the development which is done uh, compared to the relative small industry we have in media. Um, we can change, we can adapt much, much faster if we think about the internet, smartphone, and other mega industries which are driving this. Flexibility is probably one of uh, the biggest factors. We want to have the same flexibility we know from day-to-day -day work. If I go home, I pick up my iPhone, I watch video, I write an email, I can do this in my car, I can do this at any location I want to. We want to have this flexibility which we know from day-to-day in our everyday life, we want to have this as well to produce broadcast content. And the capacity. Capacity is increasing a lot. In Today we don't know whether it's 3G, 4K, as Erling explained, Moore's Law is our, our, uh, um, our driving factor which provides us whatever format is coming up in the future. Thank you, Felix and Erling. Uh, certainly an exciting migration taking place into the world of IP and the broadcast plant. And this has a lot of impact on the type of network that's required to support that migration. And I wanted to talk a little bit more detail about what this means to the network and how you build the infrastructure. So professional media data flows, right now many people are looking at SMPTE 2022-6 as the format to carry data in the world of IP. And this involves RTP multicast, actually taking SDI frames and encapsulating it in IP. But I think uh, regardless of what standard ends up being used, it's inherently a one-to-many problem. You have video sources which are generating media flows into the network, and many consumers that will consume those flows, it's a one-to-many flow. And while standards are evolving, there may well be non-SDI formatted video coming in the future, but the lesson here is that multicast is an ideal way within the network to handle this one-to-many uh, flow of information. And it's very likely that multicast will continue to be the foundation for these professional networked media flows. But in addition to that, broadcasters over time would like to carry other types of data over the same infrastructure, whether it's non-real-time streams, compressed video, editing, file-based workflows, the infrastructure is already there, and the ideal would be to leverage that infrastructure across both broadcast flows and non-real-time flows. And so all of this produces a number of requirements for the underlying Ethernet network that this has to be built upon. And I'm kind of show here five different uh, uh, characteristics that that network is going to have to adhere to. The first is it has to handle multicast well and handle it at scale. It has to be able to provide some kind of timing and synchronization for all the video sources. It has to be programmatically controlled 
to allow a broadcast control system to orchestrate everything. Ideally, it'll be able to handle both real-time broadcast flows, but also non-real-time data on the same network, so be able to handle a hybrid or converged environment. And of course, in a broadcast network, all of this has to be very high performance, completely non-blocking low latency. We can't have any drops on the Ethernet flows that are carrying broadcast uh, uh, flows and broadcast streams. So I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in each point. But of course, all of this has to happen in a scaled environment, not just a small single switch. So the first requirement to handle multicast, the way that multicast is handled in an Ethernet environment uh, can, can yield very different results. And switches in the media space have to be able to do this as a hardware replicated flow so that there's no significant latency and so it can handle flows at scale. In the past, uh, some devices in this industry have done multicast through software replication, and that simply won't work for the kind of data rates and scale that are required in a media network. In addition, there are various ways you can implement a multicast control plane, whether you use traditional IGMP to join and leave flows, whether you do programmatic control to statically map uh, multicast flows. All of this requires some kind of control plane, and definitely programmatic uh, access and programmatic control, as we'll discuss uh, in the broadcast control section. But in addition, there may be a need to accelerate that control plane. In the media space, we need to be able to add and leave multicast flows very quickly. So things like an accelerated fast leave capability from IGMP can be very important to the flexibility you need to implement this network and make it work in real life. And timing and synchronization, this is an area that's still evolving in the video world, but just as you have in a, in a legacy traditional SDI plant, uh, right now there's a GenLock concept where all the edge devices are synchronized together so that you can do proper video switching without introducing latency. And the same goal is desired in many cases in this next gen IP broadcast plant, but the idea is instead of having a separate synchronization signal distributed to all of these devices to be able to distribute clocking and synchronization through the network. And in the world of Ethernet, the standard that's developed to do that is 1588 precision time protocol. That's the most common mechanism for distributing clock very accurately in an in-band uh, in the Ethernet network. And so most of the schemes discussed in, in the world of network media involve using precision time protocol to do this timing. And this is still evolving as a standard in the video world, but in audio, AES67, that's been implemented today using 1588. So it's very important whatever network you implement is able to support 1588 PTP uh, and, and adapt as these standards evolve. The most important part of this broadcast control network, though, is really around orchestration and the broadcast control system. Uh, as as uh, Felix and Erling talked about, source timed and destination time switching, all of this requires programmatic control of the network to custom steer flows to get to their desired destination, and just as importantly, to avoid congestion. Ethernet in the data world is a best effort technology, but in the media world, we can't have dropped frames. So it's very important that the, the, the entrance into the network is not oversubscribed, that we avoid oversubscription that could lead to drops and to latency. And that's the job of the broadcast control system. It has to be able to control admittance into the network and make sure that nothing is oversubscribed. And so that needs to be done through a centralized SDN type of control. And when implementing program, programmatic control of the Ethernet infrastructure, uh, we believe it's very important to stick with open standards approach to this. Don't get locked into proprietary schemes. Keep completely open standards that are interoperable and also version independent. And this is an important point. As you uh, upgrade infrastructure, as you do software upgrades over time, it's important that the programmatic control remains version independent, that it doesn't break as you apply upgrades. And this is a common problem in networks today in the data world, depending on the mechanism they're using to do that control, can end up with issues as they do upgrades. And this idea of carrying a converged or hybrid network, of having real-time flows that are absolutely can't drop, that are, that are the primary flows, 
but also carrying other data over the same network, that requires some kind of quality of service mechanisms and, and traffic classification to deliver that hybrid networking approach. This is something which is going to take a little bit of time. In the early days, it's unlikely people will try to achieve this, but over time they're going to want to. And so looking at features and capabilities that enable this are an important part of building a future-proof infrastructure. Having quality of service in the network, but having custom flow steering is also important on top of normal network behavior, things like Arista's direct flow, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And from a hardware perspective, latency is important. Uh, latency is an enemy in the broadcast world. You need to make sure you don't have significant delays on a hop-by-hop -hop basis. You need wire rate, non-blocking performance in the switches, and you need a wide range, <coughs> excuse me, a wide range of scale whether it's a single switch that's in a small environment or a broadcast truck, or you're building a large scale network out of multiple switches, you really need choices on scale with the same underlying feature set and capabilities, the same underlying control plane, the same underlying programmability. All of these things are very important to look at when you go to build a broadcast IP infrastructure. From Arista's product portfolio, we really have four families of product that are ideally suited to this uh, building a broadcast uh, IP plant. The first is our flagship platform, the 7500E chassis. This is one of the largest and most capable switches in the industry today, supporting 1, 10, 40, and 100 gigabit speeds. It's highly scalable up to 1152 10 gig ports in a single switch. But most importantly, it has features that allow a very robust infrastructure that simply doesn't drop packets. Things like big buffers, a VOQ architecture, and 100% efficient switching fabric. This, this switch can be the foundation of a very large scale broadcast infrastructure. And a smaller version of the 7500E is our 7280. This is a fixed configuration platform and the first fixed switch in the industry to support 100 gigabits, but also supports big buffers. Our 7150 is our ultra-low latency product family, and this is ideally suited to the broadcast industry. This features latency as low as 350 nanoseconds with very, very low jitter. But it also has special timing provisions around PTP and special network telemetry and congestion detection functions that are very valuable in the broadcast industry. And finally, our 7050X platform, this has a very wide range of form factors to solve different problems and very useful particularly in WAN connections when uh, connecting remote sites and transporting media between those sites. But more important than the hardware really is the software foundation. And this is something where Arista's operating system known as EOS, Extensible Operating System, is an absolute fundamental platform upon which we build these media infrastructures. It's an open system with a Linux foundation and it has programmability at every layer in the operating system. And this is absolutely key to be able to be uh, integrated with broadcast control systems. We're known in the industry for uh, having very uh, high performance multicast. This is something we've done in the financial industry for a very long time with PIM and, and IGMP v2 and v3. But this is an extensible platform. This is something that can have customer extensions and other vendor extensions added on top of our switch to change the behavior of the network. And all of this runs across a single binary image in our switches. That has huge operational benefits of having a single image to test and deploy and manage. And our, we've, we've built in some underlying robustness into the operating system that's very new in the industry. It uses a self-healing architecture that's able to recover from software issues uh, and, and result in far fewer outages than you might have in a traditional infrastructure. Combined with that are very specific operational innovations, features around latency detection, congestion detection, instrumentation and telemetry in the network. All of these things are very valuable in building a media and entertainment network. But this extensibility is really what's key. Extensibility at every layer in our oper on our operating system whether we're talking about an SDK on the switch itself with a C++ or Python interface, or a remote API based on JSON RPC calls, we offer programmatic control of everything in a real software-defined switch. 
with the ability to add applications to the switch that run on top of Linux and become part of the basic infrastructure. And whether it's open flow, direct flow, other mechanisms to do custom flow steering, we offer a lot of choices. And that's really the key. As you go down this path, things are evolving and you need those choices to be able to support what's coming in the future. So an example of that is our direct flow feature. Direct flow is something that you can think of as a controllerless open flow. It's the ability to use open flow semantics to custom steer specific flows in the network while still having the network behave as a high performance normal layer two, layer three network. So in the case of a hybrid approach, your normal traffic works on a normal layer two, layer three wire rate switch, but the broadcast control system can use direct flow to custom program specific flow steering for the video flows and for video switching uh, reasons. And these are some of the features, again, you really want this flexibility to be able to adapt as standards adapt and requirements change. You need to have the software functionality and programmability in the network to support whatever's coming in the future. So as a summary, a closing thoughts, this movement to an IP infrastructure in the world of broadcast is happening and it's starting to happen today. The flexibility it provides, the large scale, and the Ethernet economics are all very compelling reasons why this is occurring. And, and while it is starting to, to happen, it's not going to all happen overnight. There's an awful lot of legacy equipment. There's a huge SDI infrastructure. So as these new IP infrastructures are built, they have to be linked together with the existing equipment in a seamless fashion. Clean video switching is an absolute key requirement in this infrastructure. But as you've heard from Lavo today, the edge equipment they have for conversion, the control systems, combined with Arista's cloud scale and programmability, delivers on that promise of a next-gen IP broadcast plant, and it's available with technology that's uh, on the market today. So I want to thank everyone and, and uh, look forward to any questions that may uh, uh, be out in the audience, and appreciate everyone's time today. I just see a question coming in through the chat. The question sounds, is SMT 2022-6 the only protocol we will see in the future within our video industry? My clear answer is, we have a lot of protocols uh, coming seen and going in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the past. Like ABB could also do, uh, uh, do this job. However, we will see more advantages user utilizing IP with separate streams like just the video, just the audio, and just the control data. Therefore, we need an infrastructure which provides us this flexibility in the future to implement various methodologies to, uh, to, to create a new broadcast plant. Here's another question that I might be able to help answer. Um, when do you think this migration will really happen? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, markets uh, tend to uh, follow a bell curve, and I would definitely say we're at the very, very beginning uh, of that curve. Um, some early adopters uh, are going to move in quickly to gain a, a competitive advantage, but my belief is that the, um, the broader uh, broadcast industry is going to follow along a bit more slowly. They're kind of checking things out at the moment, but we're seeing definitely uh, some very strong and solid movement by the major broadcasters towards uh, an IP and, and layer three um, implementation um, of, this, uh, of this technology and this future. Okay, and another question is coming in. The question is, there are proprietary Ethernet solutions in the market. Do you think there are advantages to this over an open standards approach? And I think I'll take this to answer from a network perspective anyway. While proprietary solutions sound great on paper, the problem is that open has been shown to win repeatedly over time. Uh, and the problem with proprietary is you get locked in. It doesn't foster competition in the industry. It doesn't create innovation. So we believe it's really essential to stay to open standards to approach you know, an open standards approach to solving these problems. And another question, can we use existing IT infrastructure to carry professional broadcast media? That's, that's an interesting one, almost certainly not. Uh, we've described a lot of the characteristics that the network has to achieve 
to handle broadcast media. Things like multicast at scale, low latency, programmatic control, custom flow steering, precision time protocol, etc. Um, and these standards are evolving. It's really important to build a flexible infrastructure to handle what's coming in the future. These are fundamentally different problems than what was solved when the IT environment was created. So it's highly unlikely that the existing IT infrastructure can handle these things. You really have to build this using modern technology and purpose built for this reason. Okay, I want to thank everyone for attending and thank you to Lavo for fantastic content. Um, for those folks who still have any questions, please feel free to reach out. You can either email me directly, warren at arista.com, or send to our corporate team, webinars at arista.com. Thank you for your time. Look forward to seeing you again in the future.